the shooting range. In this episode, Pages of History, the story of a unique helicopter that was simply too good to go out of service. Tactics and strategy. We're taking a look at how different types of terrain affect the gameplay. And metal beasts, a speedy eight-wheeled Japanese tank destroyer. In one of our recent videos, we compared the Japanese Type 16 and the Italian Centauro Romo. In the end, after much testing, the Japanese vehicle emerged victorious, making us think, why don't we tell you about it at length in Metal Beasts? The Type 16 is a wheeled tank destroyer sitting at BR 9.3. It's currently the top TD of the Japanese ground tech tree. A 105mm cannon of this SPG comes equipped with a two-plane stabilizer. It has depression elevation angles of minus 6 to plus 15 degrees. With a maxed out crew, it takes only 6.7 seconds to complete a reload. There are also two machine guns, an AA machine gun on the roof and another one coaxial to the main gun in the turret and grenade launchers on the sides of the vehicle to boot. The engine, fuel tanks and the radiator are all situated in the front. Combined with armor and 150mm thick composite plates, they provide some limited protection when attacked from the front. On a vehicle of this type though, you can't be relying on armor at all. The positions of your crew members are fairly conventional. One tanker in the front, the other three in the turret next to your first order ammo rack. The rest of the ammo is stored in the rear. Your ammo selection is full of familiar choices, if you've used a 105mm gun before, that is. Your stock round is an APFSDS that penetrates 345mm of armor at 500 meters. Then you can also unlock HEP rounds, smoke grenades as well as heat MP rounds but the best round is unlocked last. The glorious Type 93 that pierces almost 400 millimeters of steel at the same distance, or almost 230 millimeters of steel sloped at 60 degrees. All of that without even mentioning an excellent two-plane stabilizer, great optics, and a laser rangefinder. The only noticeable flaw of this gun is its very limited depression you're at your limit at minus 6 degrees. So, ridge camping is probably a no-go. The vehicle has a max speed of up to 100 kph on an even road. When going off-road though, you'll be quickly reminded that off-road rides aren't this wheel TD's forte, with your max speed dropping by half, and that's in the best case scenario. Also, keep in mind, that due to the relatively low weight of the vehicle, you might struggle going through a lot of obstacles that a regular tank breezes through. If you have to disengage though, this SPG can go pretty fast. You will reliably get 35 to 40 kph in reverse, and not just on a perfect road, but in the field as well. To maximize your chances of escape, there are also smoke discharges. What are our tactical options then? This TG is fully capable of being the first to get to a cap zone, where you will have to get rid of all incoming enemies, one after the other. It's also viable as a long-range sniping vehicle, while also retaining a lot of mobility thanks to a stabilizer. Just try to avoid areas with too many hills. With your limited elevation angles, you will do yourself a disservice fighting there. Finally, there is also a trick that only vehicles with rear-mounted turrets can pull off. The Type 16 can peek out of cover with its rear, make a shot, and quickly get back to safety. Just remember that most of your ammo is stored right in your rear. When engaging an experienced player, this tactic might prove to be too risky. Be careful out there.
Helicopters of the first generation are very different from the rotorcraft of the second. The former were equipped with piston engines, while the latter were specifically designed to make use of gas turbines. There was only one case in military history when a first-gen helicopter didn't just make it to the times of the second generation, but also found itself a pretty good niche there. The name of this helicopter is the H-34 Choctaw, and that's its story. The Korean War showed that rotorcraft can be really good at close air support. The only thing you needed was a good heli for the job. Americans experimented a lot by putting different weapon systems on the Bell 47 and the Sikorsky H-19 Chickasaw, but quickly realized that the first was too small, and the second was too much of a transport coming with too much extra stuff. That's why the team at Sikorsky decided to reconfigure the H-19 by making it lighter and giving it a more powerful engine, which is pretty straightforward, right? In the end, though, the changes to the design were so radical that it was basically a completely new helicopter. It retained the nose-mounted radial engine, but its fuselage was completely reworked. Engineers dropped the high-tail rear in favor of a more aircraft-like tail-dragger-type rear fuselage. That, obviously, meant that they had to redesign the landing gear as well. The heavy four-post pattern had to go. The team opted for a two-post configuration with a steering wheel in the rear, allowing the H-34 to steer on the ground. The vehicle performed so well that it was immediately noticed by the rest of the world. Nikita Khrushchev himself ordered the Soviet authorities to buy two H-34s from the US, and they did, paying good money to very surprised Americans. That was just the start, though. The clients were lining up all around the world. Well, the H-34 was well worth its price. For a first-gen helicopter, it turned out to be extremely easy to both pilot and to maintain. Furthermore, its open configuration and an excellent power-to-weight ratio made the helicopter very easy to modify for any kind of a role. You could outfit it with forward-mounted guns and rockets, yeah, but you could also give it proper ATGMs with all their fancy aiming equipment. By the way, that's exactly what the French Air Forces did when they were the first to use the H-34 on close air support duty in Algeria. You could literally set it up as anything. Give it even the most advanced ASW systems, torpedoes, depth charges, anything. At that point, piston engines were being shifted out everywhere in favor of turbine power plants. Piston engines were difficult to scale up and costly to operate. All of that meant first-generation rotorcraft couldn't stand a chance competing with their more modern brethren. At the same time, it turned out that you could cram not one, but two turbines under the massive nose of the H-34. That meant that you could easily outfit an existing H-34 with a more advanced engine, and quickly to boot. That's how the Royal Navy got its Westland Wessex. Originally an anti-submarine warfare helicopter, that soon was equipped with AT capabilities as well. The French modified a few helis to use turbomeca gas turbines, while Americans outfitted their own with Pratt & Whitney turbine power plants. Even in the 21st century, when the skies are full of 5-gen helicopters, making use of composite materials and heavily relying on advanced electronics, the good old H-34 is still not going anywhere. Of course, it's no longer used by the military, but its design is so cheap and so simple and so reliable that it is still king of its own hill. Speaking of hills, any player knows that the performance of a ground vehicle depends heavily on what is under your wheels or tracks at the moment. It's easy to get to max speed on a good, even road. The performance gets worse under off-road conditions. 
and many vehicles have a really tough time making it through marshy areas. On concrete, tanks tend to drift a lot, while there is next to no drifting on sand. Let's discuss how vehicles perform in different conditions and why. The main thing that you should know is that every type of terrain has two main parameters. The first is traction. Good traction means that you won't see as much skidding or drifting. The second parameter is bogginess. The boggier the terrain is, the easier it is to get stuck there in your vehicle. All in all, there are over a dozen different types of terrain in the game. The ones allowing for the highest of speeds are obviously even asphalt roads, cobblestone paths and concrete surfaces. On a surface of this type, vehicles can travel at their maximum speeds and reach that speed considerably quicker. On the other hand, because of low traction, you will have to deal with drifting, especially noticeable on fast, light vehicles. This type of surface is ideal for the quick flanking maneuver. Then we have unpaved roads that can be made of dirt, snow or sand. They already start to bog vehicles down a little, but that's still nothing serious. It's harder to accelerate on them, but you still have respectable speed. Most vehicles tend to drift on sharp turns, though. Next, then, we have common soil. That's basically any field covered by grass or cereal. This is the most common type of terrain on most of our maps. You get average acceleration and average speed on this kind of surface, with wheeled vehicles performing noticeably poorer than tracked ones. Wheels start to dig in and become stuck because of the lack of surface area. Finally, there is slushy snow, mud and loose sand. All of those are the worst when it comes to traversing terrain. It's really easy to get bogged down and to lose traction on a surface like that, even with a tank. You probably won't squeeze more than a third of your max speed there, and there is no quick acceleration. Obviously, it's not always possible to drive on good roads in most combat scenarios. How to use all that knowledge in battle then? At the start of the match, stick to roads. Keep clear of all difficult terrain types and pass areas where you can be confronted as quickly as possible. Your goal should be to occupy the best positions for your team before they fall into the hands of your enemies. If there are steep climbs to overcome, choose the way offering maximum traction. Sometimes you might need to climb at a bit of an angle so that your own tracks prevent you from sliding down. If you're going through soft or muddy soil and there is an enemy going to jump at your flank, start maneuvering ASAP. You have to account for the fact that turning takes considerably more time than usual in slush, deep mud or loose sand. If possible, get to an area with better terrain. It also goes without saying that tracked and wheeled vehicles perform very differently on different types of services. <laughs> Hell, as any experienced driver knows, the performance of a car changes drastically, even with a simple switch to a different set of tyres. It's much more noticeable when comparing tracks and wheels. On an even road, a wheel vehicle will easily breeze past the tracked tank, slowly clanking on its way. On a softer soil, though, tracked vehicles reign supreme, as they disperse their weight over a larger surface area. Wheels simply cannot compete there. Know your vehicle, know your maps, and don't forget to look at the ground, well, at least from time to time, okay? Next up are your questions from the comments. The first question was sent by Harald Shevik. When are we going to get fire extinguishers for heavy bombers like the B-17, the Lancaster and the BV-238? 
The idea is that if your engine is on fire, you extinguish the fire, but lose that engine. Hi, Harold. We're actually contemplating introducing fire extinguishing systems for aircraft, one way or another. That could be an interesting mechanism. There's no telling when it can happen or how it can work, though. It's too early to tell you anything. Keep your eyes peeled. And thanks for understanding. A user called Hagiayim asks, In what mode do you make the challenges? All the challenges, as well as all the vehicle tests for the shooting range, are conducted in RB. That concerns the performance data you see on your screen as well. By default, that's all realistic battles with a maxed out crew. The next message comes from a player called Raver's Fantasy KB. I've been wondering, what is the small device on the side of the whole row and other Japanese tanks? It looks like a mortar. If it is, will it ever be usable? Aye, that's not a mortar though. It's just a lifting jack. And what looks a bit like a barrel of a gun is just a hole where you put your digging bar for leverage. The bar is right next to the jack, by the way. The Sleeping Insomniac asks, What's the flying hospital Marcel Bloch designed? He used a Bloch MB-160 utility transport aircraft as a kind of a base and outfitted it with a complete set of tools needed to set up a hospital on the ground. The aircraft also carried medical supplies, dedicated communications equipment, a medical crew, as well as an onboard operating room. In the game, the aircraft closest to the MB-160 is the MB-162 bomber, one of the final MB-160 variants. The last message was sent by Dan the Man. Please do video on fighter tactics and maneuvers, please if you haven't done one yet. Why not? Thanks for your suggestion. We'll certainly do. That's it for today. That was The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment. I would like you to subscribe to the channel. Then, press the bell button. And finally, leave a like. And tell us what you think in the comments below. See you in a week.